So I am Rajesh Bansal, Senior Advisor at Carnegie India. A very good morning to my colleagues and participants from the Western Hemisphere and a good afternoon to the participants from India. Welcome to this knowledge transfer session on fintech and cybersecurity opportunities and challenges as a part of our virtual Global Technology Summit 2020. It is one of the five simultaneous workshops being conducted at the Global Technology Summit 2020 under the Knowledge Transfer at Carnegie India Initiative. In an ever-changing world, constant advancements and adaptations by the state, corporations and civil society are leaving behind significant knowledge gaps. These knowledge gaps can be filled by undertaking the nuances of assessing the impact of such changes on us, the stakeholders. KTE at CI aims to build a bridge between those who are at the forefront of these transformations and the stakeholders, actors, who will be impacted by them. With the purpose to thoroughly examine an issue, the workshops welcome participation of not just experts and academics, but also students, government officials, and those with the desire to actively engage with these subjects. In the prevailing virtual environment, we have been able to take this exercise to a global level, and we are very pleased about it. It is our pleasure to welcome participants from as far as Venezuela, the US, Europe, and of course, from India. Without any further ado, uh, my co-facilitators for this workshop are Natasha, whom you see on the screen. Natasha is a non-resident scholar in the Cyber Policy Initiative at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She was the former head of corporate affairs at SWIFT, where she led SWIFT's global communication, government affairs, public policy, and regulatory functions from 2012 to 2019. She's a member of the Carnegie's Fin Cyber Advisory Group, a former member of the Information Technology Industry Council, member of the European Commission's Payment System Market Expert Group, and served two terms on the European Securities and Markets Authorities Post-Trade Standing Committee. I have with me also Arthur Nelson, who is a research analyst at Carnegie's Cyber Policy Initiative based out of Washington, DC. Sorry, Arthur, we request you to join very early. And he works on international cyber security and technology policy issues, including encryption policy, cyber security in the context of the financial system, and the geopolitical dimensions of fintech. Prior to Carnegie, he worked on election security issue, issues at Elections Ontario. I have with me my other co-panelist, uh, Taylor Grossman. She's also in DC. Thanks, Taylor, for joining in so early. As she's a research analyst at Carnegie's DC office, she also works with our cyber policy initiative team. Unfortunately for us, our other esteemed colleague, Dr. Tim Moyer, who is the director of the Cyber Policy Initiative and a senior fellow, is unable to join us today. So I'll be starting the session with a few opening slides for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then I'll hand it over to Natasha. Uh, you're most welcome to write down questions in the chat box, and we will address them as we go along. Although we have also have a Q&A planned uh, at least twice during the session. Yes, friends. So the plan for the day is that we will just uh, start with growing importance of fintech in the financial sector, how the financial services landscape has changed as due to modularization, I'll deal with some of those issues. Then we'll listen to Natasha about growing cybersecurity risks. And there's an interesting timeline on our Carnegie website, and I would urge you to go through it at some point of time. Taylor is going to, uh, Taylor and Arthur will tell us more about it and highlight two, three specific incidents. Then importance of cybersecurity for the digital financial inclusion world, there is a capacity building toolbox developed by the Carnegie Endowment, which we will have a peep into. Then we'll have a Q&A. Then we'll take you briefly through the, our report recently published in collaboration 
with World Economic Forum and the IMF on the international strategy to better protect the financial system against cyber threats. And then we have a Q&A. So this is the plan for the day. So as you are aware that more than 1 billion people lack access to formal financial services and credit. Credit is a larger challenge. Uh, formal financial services access has improved in the last decade, thanks to mobile money in Africa and some of the countries like India opting for a digital identity system and a national level scheme called Pradhan Mantri or the Prime Minister's Jan Dhan Yojana. Lack of access to formal financial services also has an impact on economic opportunities because as you would all agree that if I was not able to get a housing loan or a mortgage, I would not be owning a house to be passed on, you know, and, and as an asset for me. That's a serious impact on the economic opportunities. The fintech and financial sector, the fintech is really aiding the financial deepening and inclusion and offer innovative products and services. There are a number of them. I'm sure some people from the industry are present as well. However, they also pose new risks to financial stability and integrity and consumer and investor protection. As we are all aware, there are various types of fintechs. I just tried to list the basic ones which are very well known sectors or subsectors in fintech. One is payments. Obviously, we all eventually go to some payment app run by some third party to make payments. Then we have lending. Digital lending is a big thing, especially in China, India, Tanzania, Kenya, and other markets. Well tech, insure tech, rec tech plus cybersecurity, and then there are other sectors of fintech. So fintech has an interesting you know, growth in the world. In some markets and in certain segments, the space is dominated by the fintechs, for example, in India. In India, the payments landscape as some of you who might be aware, India runs uh, an instant payment system called UPI, Unified Payment Interface. So the, the dominance is that you have third party fintechs like Buildesk, PayU, Google Pay, Amazon Pay, Phone Pay. You download their app, especially Google Pay, Amazon Pay, PayU, and make a payment without realizing that eventually you are using your bank account to make the payment. Another example from India is an investment where a company like Zeroda has more account than traditional well established players in the securities trading market. In some of the sectors in India, you know, like digital lending, P2P, it is still yet to catch up. Although we see a good traction and there are more than 200 startups in this sector. And India has set up an account aggregator framework, which should help, you know, scaling up in digital lending. However, in some of the markets in Africa, mobile money and digital lending is very important. The best known example, as we know, is in Kenya, where Mshwari loan is given with a few clicks to the users of M-Pesa, that is the Vodacom service, mobile money. In the US market, it has been an interesting take in the last one decade. America's top three lenders, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and Bank of America, has seen their share of home loan origination fall from a peak of 49% to just 19% in the first half of 2019. The companies like Quicken Loans, Loan Depot, and I have with me colleagues from US who can talk more about, uh, give more examples. Uh, and some of these companies in this pandemic have ensured that they can close a mortgage loan online, fully digital, and their market share in mortgage market in US has been growing even this year. I don't have the latest numbers though. So let us quickly look at, you know, what is the traditional bank look like? If you look on the left, you look at the various pillars or the various categories of you know, services offered by traditional banks or universal bank. You have the wholesale payments, clearing and settlement infrastructure. You have wholesale banking and markets. Then obviously you have retail and commercial banking, which and then there is customer relationship, 
and obviously they are universal bank they also offer me payment services which is changing and i'll deal with you know the right side of the graphic in a bit, minute so what is happening is instead of the universal vertically integrated financial service like a bank what we are seeing is is an increasing modularization of financial services they are leveraging highly specialized and technologically sophisticated third party providers often on a plug and play or paper use basis so if a bank let's say like city bank wants to outsource uh you know digital lending or wants to get into digital lending they might hire a third party fintech who will have algorithms and a credit scoring model which can plug into the city bank system and tell them yes good to go or not or a red flag so other you know activities like origination customer due diligence and onboarding analytics compliance risk management some of these activities are now being managed by separate providers unlike in the past where banks are providing end to end financial services example as i have already told you in india or the biggest example being talked about in 2020 in the world of investments is robin hood as we are all aware robin hood you can open an account instantly you can transact in securities in a matter of minutes and millions of gen z gen z is using it i'll take in two examples from an oliver myman report to see to give you more insights into how the modularization has happened let's say if you look on the left top as it transact you have specially you know telecom money which is mobile money you have cryptocurrencies you have digital wallets you have card specialists so you might have an account with a bank but you might use the services of any of them uh to transact you might save using robo advisors savings bonds funds and etfs money market funds through third party apps eventually you know talking to your dmat account you could borrow from marketplace lending where the money might land up in your account you know consumer finance company leasing companies and also insurance protection you could you know be having one major insurance company which you deal with but on the top of that there will be layers of telematics insurers p2p insurers or response so the regulators like the reserve bank of india has clear framework on cyber security for banks and they have given detailed guidelines like in india all banks have to establish a securities operations center however for the fintech space very few jurisdictions have come out with very specific guidelines for example in india the fintechs follow the information technology act however the increasing concern and that is the reason for this knowledge transfer is that as we gradually see opening of the apis and increasing modularization there is a growing cyber security threats for fintechs as well as financial stability i'll now request natasha to come in and talk to us about you know her example that she has seen thank you rajesh um so um thank you very much for inviting me today and uh, for everyone that's listening um just a bit more background on myself i'm no by no means a cyber expert um my introduction to cybersecurity was was somewhat brutal i was working at swift when the bangladesh bank attack happened and swift is um for any of you that are not familiar with it it's a highly secure international messaging system supporting international bank transfers and the swift system itself and, and the organization has a huge emphasis on security in all its dimensions physical uh, and virtual um but with the attack on bangladesh a new vulnerability was exposed that exposed the entire financial system um but it was one i think that the neither the industry nor the organization had really spent any time thinking about because if they if, if we all had um it, it probably wouldn't have happened now the the original attack on the bangladesh bank uh, aimed to steal a billion dollars they got away with significantly very significantly less than that um but very quickly it turned into a whole industry and that industry continues today 
uh, people selling malware, compromised bank accounts and trying to compromise other banks of, of different scale around the world. Um, since then, I've, I've moved on. I now spend quite a lot of my time thinking about consumer issues. So having spent really a lifetime in the wholesale um, area of the financial markets, I now uh, in the UK spend quite a long time looking at consumer financial issues. Um, the UK has moved to digital banking in, in quite a big way. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as, as quite a sophisticated society, although our friends in Europe, <laughs> probably many of you in India might challenge that. Um, but we have a very high level of, um, of digital banking and e-money e um, and a very low level of national cyber awareness. I think not at necessarily the governmental level, but at the individual level. Um, but so to come to the to the risk, I think I like to think of the risk in, in sort of five dimensions. First is the growing digitization of, of our societies. Um, in developed economies, um, we might have thought we were at sort of digi max before the pandemic and then the pandemic occurred and suddenly our schools and our teachers learned how to deliver Zoom and team lectures, although having seen my daughter's uh, teachers' efforts at that. I think they've got some way to go. But we've brought more people have turned to digital finance, to digital education, to remote working and so on and so forth. And that movement into the digital sphere is, is not something that's going to be reversed. I don't think if anything, it will it will continue and more will follow. We're also hoping in the UK and around the world that digital will help financial, educational and social inclusion. Um, there, there are limits to that, um, but one of the biggest limits is probably that that stems from cyber security. If we're going to expect the, the most vulnerable, the least educated, the least equipped, uh, and sometimes the poorest to move into the digital sphere, then we need to equip, make sure they're equipped, if not with cyber awareness, then at least with all the cyber protections they can need. Because all of this rests on trust and we without trust none of none of these things that depend on digital will will survive and then of course we've got maybe a future of crypto stable or cbdc i know that rajesh has got a discussion on cbdc tomorrow but all of this is an inexorable move to to digital which as i mentioned before isn't matched the second challenge is is the awareness so digitization can and is a force for good but only if it's matched by the by awareness and, and protection and as I think Satya Nadella has argued that societal trust in technology has been falling recently and we haven't had huge major disruptions of the scale that are possible. We haven't we haven't been there, um, but we could. And if that evaporation, in, if, if we did, uh, the, evap the resulting evaporation in trust would would be horrific. But with the move to remote workforces, digital banking, clouds, increased outsources, Increased, out, increased outsourcing, increased use of, of social media, corporate education and otherwise. All of this increases the attack services, but there's very scant evidence that it's been matched by, um, by an increase in cyber awareness. And we, we shouldn't think for a second that this migration that's happened over the last nine months has been supported um, by investment in, in cyber awareness. And post-pandemic, with finances, national finances, corporate finances, educational finances stretched as they will be, uh, there is a there's a huge risk of underinvestment in the future, whether in education, patching, upgrades. Um, th this is really going to continue, I think. Now, alongside that, to the third risk is is the threat itself. Uh, what's the threat doing? It's doing what it does best. It's multiplying. It's proliferating. I don't think it's uh, there's a proper account of how much risk has, has been driven directly by COVID. It, it might be impossible ever to quantify, but I think it's clear that the risk has risen and the threat has risen and the rise in sophistication has been quite staggering. And some of the reports that um, the cybersecurity firms are helpfully giving us for what they're projecting in 21, 2021 are really quite terrifying with synthetic media, the use of AI to generate voices, videos, face, faces, fictitious personnel, um, the growing ranks of cyber mercenaries, of hackers for hire, obviously state actors and the geopolitics, which I think Arthur's going to go into, uh, don't help on that. But we've seen an alleged state attack against FireEye, FireEye the, um, the US cybersecurity uh, specialist, and for any of those that are not aware, 
the um, the alleged state state sponsor stole the red team exercises. So all of those are, are in effect, I suppose, null and, null and void. I don't think uh, FireEye has, has pronounced that, but uh, clearly they know now how people are dressed rehearsing for this for this eventuality. We've got misinformation, disinformation, espionage, corporate theft, and of course, plain old theft, which banking is always going to be uh, susceptible. And this, this copycat issue, um, to go back to the Bangladesh uh, attack, um, at the time, we were very focused on Bangladesh. So in, in the immediate aftermath of, of the attack, there was a lot of misinformation going on. There was a lot of um, disagreement between various parties as to who did what to whom when and whose fault it was. And uh, everyone was trying to find, find things out. And the journalists uh, were very keen to find all of this out, but they were also um, very, very keen to find out if there were more. And it was really the journalistic community together with the forensic community that unearthed further attacks that had happened in the past. Um, I think there'd been two before Bangladesh, which were really mirror images of the same thing. Uh, and then subsequently many, many, many followed. Um, but the industry that was created out of that one attack continues to this day, and we're three years later. And we can't forget that, that every success will breed an industry. Um, then we have the scarcity of the workforce, which is something that Carnegie has been working on quite hard. Um, notwithstanding its best efforts, this challenge is enormous. Um, there's a huge undersupply of professionals. There's probably a lack of imagination in training. Uh, there's, the pipeline is, is very thin. There is a possibility of the current um, employment situation creating an opportunity if, if industry in particular uh, will be imaginative and retrain uh, staff because there simply isn't the supply um, to, to fuel the protection we need in the, in the future. But probably the single biggest challenge and, and the challenge with, without which none of the other risks can be addressed is the coordination problem, which is where Carnegie has really been focusing its effort. If you don't address the coordination problem, none of the rest will, will really be of use. You can reduce the threat, you can increase the workforce, you can increase awareness, but unless there's coordination across industry, across industries and across countries, it's impossible to solve, to begin to solve for the cybersecurity threat. And we saw in, in the Bangladesh uh, attack, we saw in glorious technicolor quite how problematic that lack of coordination can be, whether between uh, government agencies, through law enforcement, um, privacy laws, secrecy laws, all sorts of things made it very, very difficult to both protect in the future and to redress and to, to, to really deal with it with a growing problem. And we see this at the, at the micro level. So let me take the UK where we have a um, an instant payment system called Faster Payments. Uh, it's dates from I think 2007, so it's older than yours, but it's not as successful as the uh, as the Indian version. Um, it, we've, we process far fewer payments through this system, but we do. And it's it's basically the account to account transfer system that if we're transferring account to account, we really use person to person and person to business in the UK. Now, a subset of the UK banks are direct members of faster payments and other banks can join uh, through agents, if if you will. So it's not it, it's one form of transfer with a subset of of banks within a country. So you would have thought, you would have thought that if there was a, a cyber related problem related to this, they could have agreed what the outcome would be, what the norms would be. Have they? No. So if I'm the victim of, I as a user, I'm a victim, a victim of an authorized push payment scam, for instance and I've taken every measure I could reasonably have taken to protect myself, is there an agreed form of responsibility and redress? No. And this I think is really problematic because if you can't get to these kind of agreements within small communities, it's very difficult to imagine how we can do it at a global level. And the global financial system needs to come to this consensus. We need to come to, to agreements. Is it, the, is it the outsource provider that's responsible for turning the perimeter 
or and where is the perimeter? Is it their perimeter or is it the organizational perimeter? And you can see this from, again, from the very small account to account, who is responsible or the device, who is responsible, me or Apple? Is it me or the bank? And if it's, is it the victim's bank or is it the um, the compromised, the, the, the bank that's holding the compromised um, accounts um, responsibility? So this, the the efforts that Carnegie is is making in 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 this in this respect with its international strategy, I think, is hugely hugely important. But we can't forget that it also has to be done in country, and that challenge in country isn't 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 done. I think as a final point on this is the the question of the providers of the tools. So in in. In my last organization, that was Swift, who sold interfaces and sold connectivity to organizations. Those products now are very, very different from a cybersecurity perspective to what they look like pre-Bangladesh. Pre-Bangladesh, really all the onus and the legal onus remains on the banks, but really the, the protection onus was really on the organizations rather than on the interface. Now those interfaces are much better protected. iPhones, Samsung's, it, it doesn't matter. These devices will need to be much better protected if society is going to continue its trust. And again, there will need to be international agreement about the provision of these instruments. If you're providing instruments into my country, if my banking system is going to depend on a piece on a on Microsoft Windows or iPhones or otherwise, there needs to be agreement about how these products come in. So with that, I shall pass over if that's all right, Rajesh. Thanks, Amanda Natasha, for giving your perspective. I'll request Arthur to talk to us now. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning uh, to my colleagues in DC. Uh, I'm going to be sharing just briefly um, the timeline of cyber involving financial institutions that the Carnegie Endowment has developed with BAE Systems. Uh, and this is primarily uh, a resource for folks to understand how the threat landscape is changing over time. Uh, including how the threat landscape has now begun to involve fintechs. Uh, and so here, very briefly, we have a timeline of over 200 uh, incidents. This is not comprehensive, but rather meant to show you how uh, threat actors are beginning to target different banks uh, and financial institutions and financial services differently. And we've seen the threat landscape grow in, in a number of ways. The two that I'll highlight one, we see state actors, uh, in many cases North Korea, for example, who've targeted uh, 38 countries around the world at this point, um, begin to target financial institutions more and more, some for financial gain and also some for disruptive purposes. The second I would highlight is that we're seeing more destructive attacks that get really closer to uh, core banking systems and concerningly could affect the integrity of financial data, which would be a, an outcome far more alarming than uh, simply uh, for theft. Um, and so here I'll just highlight a few how this works. Uh, in the timeline, you can filter by uh, which uh, incidents by country, by incident type from a data breach to a data theft to espionage, by actor type from non-state actor and state sponsor, by attribution and by year. And so briefly here, I'll filter for India. Arthur, can I request, are you on full screen? I am, is this is the oh, screen? Okay. screen? Okay, okay, sure, sure, thanks. And so very briefly here, we have an example of an incident uh, where the North Korean Beagle Boys global campaign, as the US government has dubbed it, uh, where they highlight here how many countries the North Koreans have targeted over a period of uh, four years, um, which began with the Bangladesh incident in which North Korea attempted to sp steal over $1 billion from Bangladesh's central bank, which, by the way, is about 0.5% of Bangladesh's GDP and has systemic implications. Um, they also targeted uh, financial institutions in India multiple times. For example, uh, coming down here, the Cosmos Bank Swift Heist in August of 2018. We're also seeing incidents that are beginning to affect uh, mobile applications and uh, payment services on mobile devices. For example, here, 
uh, just in May 14 uh, of 2020, uh, India's computer emergency response team released a warning that a mobile banking malware called EventBot was stealing personal financial information from, from Android users in India. Uh, so we'll highlight here, I'll stop here. Uh, this is just a quick resource for folks who might be interested in the evolving threat landscape. But I would conclude uh, and then uh, hand back over to Taylor now um, with the, the following, um, the, the fact that digital financial services, uh, as Rajesh has explained, are, are beginning to unbundle uh, has significant implications for security and the threat landscape. Um, on one hand, many of the users uh, lack the cybersecurity awareness, um, and that has consumer protection implications. Um, on the other hand, many of these fintechs aren't dealing with the legacy infrastructure um, of some of these larger financial institutions. And so they do have opportunities to roll out more robust cybersecurity by design in their products. Uh, so rather than thinking of cybersecurity as an afterthought, they can build in the security measures and controls up front. Um, and so I think there's a, a great opportunity here, uh, provided there's the right supervisory approach. Um, but there's also a lot of risk as we see many of these new users adopt these new services as they become accustomed to the Internet. And with that, I'll hand it over to Taylor. Hello all, good afternoon, good morning. Thanks Arthur, thank you Natasha, and thank you Rajesh. I'm going to share my screen and give a brief overview of our capacity building toolbox, um, as well as some of the newer financial inclusion efforts that the Carnegie FinCyber program has been undertaking. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, we can see it, Taylor. Uh, maybe you will have to just do it in the slide mode. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Great. Um, so I am delighted to be here to share Carnegie's capacity building toolbox for smaller financial inclusions. Um, and my goals here in this about 10 minute presentation are just first to outline the problem that we're trying to address. Second, I will look at the solution that's offered by the toolbox and give some concrete examples of how it works. Um, and finally, I will end by highlighting the ways uh, that we're still looking for partnerships in this space um, and also highlight some of the ways that the toolbox fits into our broader financial inclusion efforts. Um, so as we've already heard a bit about today, 2016 was a real wake up call for the global financial community. Um, and Natasha has already highlighted the Bangladeshi bank incident in detail um, and Arthur has alluded to it as well. So I won't go too much more into detail, but I just wanna highlight that um, this incident really demonstrated the vulnerabilities of smaller financial organizations, particularly those in low and lower middle income countries. And this event really helped launch the FinCyber program at Carnegie, which has expanded over the past few years to include the, the nine tiles that you see now on the screen. Um, and this includes also the strategy report, which was launched last month, which has six pillars that really help define our work and our work product for the next couple of years. And the toolbox is at the center of the capacity building pillar that the strategy goes into. Now, the toolbox um, has been around for a bit, and in the early years of Carnegie's FinCyber project, um, we discovered a real a key gap. Um, governments, businesses, and international institutions have been focusing a lot more attention on cybersecurity capacity building. And there was lots of guidance coming out for cybersecurity for small businesses, and also lots of technical guidance for major financial institutions. However, smaller financial organizations were not adequately protected and were essentially getting lost in this space between these two types of guidance. And these organizations don't have the resources of major financial institutions, but because of the interconnected nature of the global financial system, they still need strong, robust protections. And so in 2019, Carnegie launched its capacity building toolbox as a way to remedy this gap. Um, and you can see here the range of partners we've had for this project, including the World's Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Economic Forum, um, as well as many others. 
And the toolbox really was created through an iter iterative process with feedback from these key stakeholders across the technical cybersecurity community and the fin financial sector. And it includes a lot of other stakeholders um, that aren't official partners, but that gave feedback throughout the process. And our goal here is again, to really produce living guides. So we launched the project in 2019. And then this year we expanded the toolbox based on renewing this feedback loop. So the capacity building toolbox consists of eight guides and accompanying checklists. And first we have a board level guide and a CEO level guide. And these really help set out the priorities for the senior executive team. And then you can see here next on the slide, we have three CISO level guides. The first looks at protecting the organization. The second focuses on customer protections. And the last addresses third party connections and associated risks, something we've seen a lot in the news uh, just as recently as yesterday. Um, and we also have an incident response guide, which walks an organization step by step through how to react and, and deal with an actual cyber event. In 2020, we've added a ransomware guide, um, which highlights some of the risks um, that are posed by a remote workforce. And, and Natasha already highlighted the ways in which we've really gone digital uh, in a lot of different facets of, of the workforce, uh, not necessarily uh, adding adequate supporting uh, protections. And so, you know, it became very clear that the, the toolbox really needed a, a specific way to address uh, ransomware and, and the threats that are associated. And then we also have a workforce development guide. Um, and again, I think Arthur might touch on this a bit more in the strategy, um, but this was really linked to our strategy work, thinking about ways to build up uh, the retention and the pipelines um, that bring key talent into organizations. And now the guides are available, uh, right now they're available in seven languages. We are expanding to 10 different languages, which will be ready uh, shortly into the new year. Um, Cause we really want these to be as accessible as possible and to get out and disseminate into as many hands as possible. And each guide also comes with associated checklists that are action oriented, which I'll demonstrate shortly. And they're really built to be user friendly. One page guides for each subject that you can put right up on the wall and essentially just check off uh, after you've uh, addressed each action item. And the guides also include an executive summary and a supplementary report. And these pieces explain how we got to each recommendation and offer concrete guidance on how to achieve the recommendation. These guides are not a new invention, rather they build off of a range of excellent existing guides from the UK's National Cybersecurity Center Guide for Small Businesses to the NIST Cybersecurity Framework and other technical guides. Um, they're really just meant to be, um, to, to distill the best wisdom and to address the significant gap that I've talked about before. Uh, and again, to be very user-friendly and action-oriented so that each step really corresponds with something that, that you can do to protect your organization. So here is what the board level guide looks like. Uh, I just wanna highlight the overarching focus of the toolbox, which is really to address not just the key technical aspects of cybersecurity, but also the value of setting organizational priorities from the top down. And here, you know, we, we see again and again that leadership is really crucial, particularly for smaller organizations, which have limited resources and are, which are making really difficult decisions between where to put those resources. And so our board and CEO level guides are built to set out concrete actionable steps for making cybersecurity a priority throughout the organization. And these action items are not resource intensive, rather they're structured to be achievable by small institutions with limited bandwidth. And we're really hoping that the toolbox helps set a baseline of, of where organizations should be to, pro to provide adequate cybersecurity protection. And I also want to highlight uh, one of the new guides on ransomware. Again, with the pandemic, it's become really clear uh, that institutions need actionable steps to uh, reduce the risks of ransomware uh, as we all continue to be remote today. Um, and the guide, again, you know, is structured to really break things down. So we have a section on real-time protection, which looks at anti-malware investment, um, how to strengthen work from home protocols, and other concrete steps um, an, an institution can build um, you know, through its uh, understanding, particularly of uh, remote work. 
We also have guidance on data backups, uh, which can help mitigate the effects of a ransomware attack. Um, and then finally, the guide includes an approach um, for, the, for an organization to consider its unique regulatory environment. Um, you know, as we know, guidance is shifting in this space all the time. Uh, for example, guidance in the US just changed this year. Uh, now paying a ransom is not recommended since it could violate existing sanctions regimes. Um, so the guide flags um, you know, some of these considerations to be taken into account, um, as well as the importance of continually updating protocols based on um, shifting regulatory changes. And the ransomware guide comes with an accompanying checklist, which is built again to be put right on the wall where organizations leaders can simply run through these items and cross them off as they achieve them. Um, and the key here again, I know I've said this before, is, is just that it's action oriented. Um, so each piece corresponds to a concrete step that can be taken by an institution. So under real-time protection, there are six main components um, and they're structured as specific activities. And the guide demonstrates not just the goal, but how the organization can get there. Um, and the capacity building toolbox is, is also part of uh, a newer pillar that, that we've launched in the FinCyber program on cybersecurity and financial inclusion. And as we've seen, financial inclusion efforts around the world often rely on digital platforms to provide access to financial services. Uh, you know, the Gates Foundation um, has predicted that by 2030, there will be 2 billion new users that will store money and make payments on their phones. And cybersecurity is essential, as we know, to safeguarding this innovation and to making banking accessible. Um, what we've seen in this space, though, is two trends. The Financial Supervisory Committee a community has really stepped up its capacity building activities in low-income countries. And then secondly, the development community has increasingly focused on cybersecurity to protect its achievements over the past decade in this space. And as Rajesh pointed out earlier, uh, you know, th there are a lot of gaps in this space. Uh, fintechs uh, often don't have clear cybersecurity frameworks. Um, you know, but but might be addressing some of these um, inclusion efforts. And then this is a persistent problem. So what we're really doing is trying to build the connective tissue between these two communities, between the financial supervisory and regulatory community and the development and financial inclusion community. Uh, and so just last week, we hosted an event um, that was designed to facilitate the knowledge transfer among these various stakeholders. Um, and so to that end, we had both the managing director of the IMF, as well as Her Majesty Queen Maxima, who is the UN Special Representative for Financial Inclusion, as keynote speakers to, uh, to again, start to really help, uh, help build connections um, across these really disparate institutions. We're also working on uh, mapping key institutions and stakeholders in this space um, and, and building a dialogue across this space through research and, and through our, our convening power. Um, and I just want to close again. Um, I've, I've thanked our partners on the toolbox as well, and, and, and many of these organizations have also been partners in, in this financial inclusion effort uh, because it, it's just so important to, to get people from across, uh, across these spaces, uh, you know, together in the same room, talking about the same things um, and, and identifying both gaps and duplications. Um, you know, Carnegie is an international affairs think tank, and, and we really rely on our partnerships with organizations like this uh, for the toolbox and for our other efforts. Um, so, you know, to that end, we, especially with the toolbox, we really can't do this without the help of um, partners like these to help to, to disseminate these guides and get them in the hands of, of on the ground users um, across the world. So, you know, if you're interested in partnering with us, please let us know. Um, we, we really want to make these guides as usable as possible um, for, for as many as possible. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to Arthur, I believe. Um, thank you. Yeah. Rajesh, is the plan to now open up to Q&A? Yeah, uh, let's do that. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I would encourage our participants so you can unmute uh, yourself and we would be happy to take live questions. If you are hesitating to type it out, we are all you know, ears and would be keen to you know, answer any concerns or questions you have so far.
Anyone? Rajesh, as our, as our audience thinks, perhaps I could pose a question to you. Uh, actually, we, I think we have a question, but I have one in, in hand. Okay, sure. <laughs> Yeah, we have Prati Singh who has raised the hand. Prati, please go on. Prati, sorry, Prati. Yeah. You can please ask, unmute yourself. You are on mute right now. Yeah. Um, namaste to uh, all the panelists. And it was uh, really an insightful session to be uh, able to hear from the experts. Uh, I wanted to ask my question that uh, as, as, Indeed, as yesterday, I was reading an article by the Prime Minister, uh, which had an expression of the project of self-reliant uh, India and how it has a lot of incentive in the financial sector and combining the financial sector with the technological sector. And we very well know that India has, has its own flaws when it comes to cybersecurity and financial technology. So uh, does the panel think that uh, India is ready for a revolution in terms of integrating uh, fintech into its uh, economy and uh, its uh, transactions. Uh, do you think that circumstances are uh, permitting for a revolutionizing approach towards uh, this uh, concern? Yeah. Arthur, I will take a shot at it. <laughs> yeah. So the, that's a very good question and, you know, very topical, as Honorable Prime Minister also mentioned this week. So as you would appreciate that India has built the key foundational pieces for enabling financial technologies growth, which is in terms of India's stack, where it is it is a one of the countries with 1.3 billion people having an ID to electronic KYC, instant digital KYC. It doesn't exist in many other countries. Obviously, Estonia is a different world altogether. And then on top of that, we build a digital locker, which allows storing of documents, digital signature through e-sign, and then UPI, as an instant payment layer. On top of which has been built the account aggregator framework. So all of that put together, we have seen a number of innovations in the last three years, three to five years on top of India stack. And I would encourage, I mean, I, I don't know what, whether you're a student or you plan to get into a FinTech or you run a FinTech, that I think the, the gap in serving more than 600 million people in India is a vast opportunity for fintechs to you know to grow in in a country like India. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other question? Or Arthur? Meanwhile, happy to answer. You wanted to ask something? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things I'm most curious about is. Uh, I mean, as we think about India's leadership in digital payments um, and we think about the market power they have uh, in, in the global economy uh, and in many of the uh, multinational financial firms that are beginning to uh, roll out services in India from, uh, you know, Google and uh, WhatsApp to Walmart's acquisition of um, the phone fee. Uh, curious how you think about the India's uh, ability to leverage that market power as well as their their well positioned leadership around digital uh, payments innovation to shape international standards is there opportunity there and and how would they how would you recommend the Indian government think about that? So thanks, Arthur. One is I think you got a chance to see our day three agenda where there is a specific panel on how to take UPI, the Unified Payment Interface Global, to make cross-border instant payments very low cost. You know, unlike today's, you know, the network of correspondent banks and everything. Natasha, I'm not mentioning any specific institutions. Uh, you know, so uh, UPI is India's innovation on instant payment, the framework which allows any tech stack or any technology company, like as you mentioned, whether it's WhatsApp or whether it's Amazon or Google or whoever, to build on top of that to enable cross-border. The government of India has made it, it's one of its key mandates to look at developing the emerging world and see what can the world learn from UPI in particular, 
And if you might be aware, just a few months back, NPCI, the entity which runs UPI, has set up an international subsidiary. It's a unique thing that a uh, you know, quasi-government entity like the NPCI, National Payment Corporation of India, has set up an entity just a few months back with the basic mandate to take some of India's innovation in payments like UPI and its own homegrown domestic card like Rupay to the world. And the India stack story, thanks to our development partners like the World Bank, uh, you know, they are advocating the use, the advantages of an India stack kind of an open architecture on top of which different ecosystem of payments, lenders could also be built. Thanks. Rajesh, can I can I come in on that just yes, to yeah. add some other thoughts? Um, I mean, I think the the UK has a lot to learn uh, from the success of UPI on a couple of fronts, um, on many fronts. But uh, one I particularly point out is the ADHAR and the lack in the UK of uh, digital ID. Uh, in the UK, we're not keen on ID <laughs> at all. We periodically no, go through a sort of you know a, a national self questioning: should we have one? Could we have one? How bad would it be? And we agree not. Um, so faster payments was introduced in 2007. And the way that you make a bank transfer using faster payments is to put in a sort code and a very long account number. And it's all rather cumbersome and painful. And we don't do it on our phones, especially if we're a certain age, because we can't put in digits that are that's on a screen that that small. So the usability, the user friendliness that you have, the the, the one, the, the form of identification and two, the easy method of, um, of transferring, we simply don't have. Um, and perhaps there wasn't as much consideration of the overall architecture as that there has been uh, in India, which which has which has helped. Now you came a bit later than us and technology had moved on. So not only did you have the ad hub, but you also had a much more developed API API kind of um, ecosystem. So you, you had that advantage. The other difference that there is, and I think this is where export becomes difficult with payments, is that the legacies are different and payments are very, very national things. We've seen Alipay and Tencent trying to expand outside China. How are they doing that? They're doing that with the Chinese diaspora. They're not going into Germany and expecting, well, maybe they are, but anyway, they're, they're not succeeding in, in getting the German consumer onto their platforms, but rather like JCB uh, supports Japanese tourists and Union Pay supports Chinese tourists around the world. Um, Tenpay and Alipay are successfully doing that, or, or if they are being successful, that's what where they're being successful. It's not in changing a national custom. So I think the existing legacy in the country, a country without a legacy infrastructure, much as Kenya had, the legacy infrastructure Kenya had was, was mobile phones and a distributed network. Um, the UK has what it has now. To change that completely to something completely different would be very, very difficult. It's more likely to transition off an existing infrastructure. And so maybe parts of a payment system or a payments technology stack can be exported to, to places where there are absences. But I think the wholesale transplant of a system from one economy, one payment economy to another might be might be a leap. So Natasha, I fully agree with you. And so hence NPCI has been taking baby steps by you know having a tie up with Singapore. Uh, Bhutan, Nepal, launching the Rupee card and some of these geographies, acceptance network. On taking a cue from what you just mentioned, whether it was JCB or Alipay following where the Chinese tourists or the Japanese tourists go and businesses go. So that is definitely the approach. And, you know, I've been on, uh, you know, kind of pro bono advisory to government of India, looking at what is the right strategy to to go global and as you rightly said i agree we cannot look at replacing the wholesale you know payment systems of countries we will have to see which are the countries which are do not have legacy systems i know of couple of countries in africa which have very primitive payment systems currently and even mobile money is not well developed so some of those countries are a good you know fit uh, for India's uh, export and including possibly for economic diplomacy as well, if I can say that. 
things. Sorry, I see a question by Sujat. He says, can the respective panelists shed some light on the requirements, if any, of the legislation at the global stage? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I can't see the full question. Can you read? Yeah. Global stage, that is UN level to adopt a single or similar cybersecurity protocol across the globe. And I think Arthur or Taylor, you are the best place. You've been interacting very closely. Sure, I can take a stab at this one uh, and Taylor, feel free to, to chime in. Um, so I would say that uh, discussions at the UN over any sort of legislation have in the last decade started strong and then fallen apart. Um, so the, the process has mainly gone through a, something called a group of governmental experts, which is a, a group of about 25 countries uh, that come together to discuss how international law applies to cyberspace. And I'll caveat this by saying um, the UN has not gone nearly as granular as discussing specifically how it applies to cyberspace in the context of the financial system. Um, but in 2013 and in 2015, um, the, the countries agreed, um, despite some difficulties and geopolitical tensions, that international law did apply to cyberspace. But there is some concern and disagreement about how. Um, and then in 2017, the group met again and was unable to uh, reach any sort of consensus. And since then, um, a second process called the Open-Ended Working Group has emerged that's more inclusive to other countries around the world and has expanded not only to just um, countries beyond that original 25, but also to some nonprofits and, and industry organizations. So Microsoft has been very involved in those negotiations as well. Um, but as it stands right now, there's some disagreement over um, the, the use of IC, ICT in uh, international law, particularly as it relates to information-related harms. And that's where we see um, some Western values around free speech um, conflict with some other values uh, that you might see that, that China and Russia have, have argued strongly for, um, as, particularly as it relates to sovereignty around cyberspace. So those two uh, stances uh, have not been reconciled, and so there's continuing conversation there. The other uh, piece of legislation that I would highlight would be the Budapest Convention, which is around how countries uh, cooperate when it comes to international law enforcement and cybercrime cooperation. Um, and here we have about, at this point, I think about 70 signatories that have signed on. Um, and the goal with this is for countries to uh, agree um, because cybercrime and, and, and malicious cyber activity uh, doesn't respect borders, countries have to agree what um, a crime in one country might be must also be a crime in another country. And so the Budapest Convention tries to reconcile those legal frameworks at the national level. Um, but uh, there are also indications that certain countries are, are beginning to sh um, advocate for, a, 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 again, that kind of split process and then a whole other cybercrime treaty. Um, so the state of uh, international dialogue around cyberspace is uh, limited and has stalled a bit um, and has reduced now more to the, the bilateral level um, where two countries will uh, find more agreement just between themselves rather than in a multilateral process. Um, and then uh, certainly has not gotten, like I said, to the, to the uh, very specific level of um, how cybercrime uh, or malicious cyber activity applies in the context of the financial sector. But I would close on, on one note, which is that there is an opportunity, I believe, to make some advances if you think about um, the convergence of uh, financial crime and cyber crime, where um, financial crime uh, is often recognized by both countries more frequently than a cyber crime might be. And so if you think about offenses in the context or through the lens of um, a financial crime or fraud, there's more room, I think, there or basis for uh, international cooperation um, than there might be uh, if you were just to think about it as a cyber crime. Thank, thanks, Arthur. Uh, 
I'll go to Kapil's question, and I think Natasha, would you like to take that? How can the blockchain system, which has been quite tight for transfer of forex across borders, be useful for cybersecurity in fintech? Yeah. Mm. Um, gosh, I'm not sure I can be. No, uh, no worries. So, uh, no worry. So, as uh, I can take a shot at it. So, blockchain is definitely uh, a useful technology that can be used for transfer of forex reserves, forex transfers across borders. Uh, however, you know, the main issue in forex transfers is not just the underlying technology. I would say it is the connecting pipes which matter. With Swift did beautifully with all the correspondent banking networks. There are a lot of fintechs which have started, you know, connecting the pipes and make it easier, cheaper to for cross-border remittances. However, there is still a 7% charge on an average. So that is where I see that there is a role of blockchain, but it's not going to be easy to for the entire ecosystem to move to a blockchain to be able to transfer and to address the security issues in you know forex transfers yeah anything you want to add arthur or taylor on that we just maybe, maybe i will i will sort of sure. come in on it i mean i think sure. when we look at the the friction in cross border transfers where does it come from and would blockchain alleviate that uh, so the the frictions come from the foreign exchange itself so the exchange of currency which isn't going to be removed by blockchain, maybe by Bitcoin, if that's the way we go, or uh, super CBDC or interchange of CBDCs, but but it, blockchain can't do anything on that. And then we have the financial crime uh, issues, so the, 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 um, the work that banks need to do or financial institutions need to do to check um, uh, to check that uh, transactions are compliant. And those are probably the two biggest biggest areas of friction. And again, well, at a micro level, uh, yes, blockchain type solutions might help with identification and so forth. But at the end of the day, if you want to send a transaction from rural Wales to rural Rajasthan uh, and you're using two small local institutions, you've got many people along the chain. Um, but I think, again, unless you have a single currency, unless Libra now DM takes over the world, um, the, the solutions will need to be otherwise. And to come back to the cost issue, I think the problem that is really manifested isn't in the wholesale area where SWIFT is operating, where you're dealing with really high value transfers between large financial organizations and businesses. And net net, those transactions are really very low cost, whether the, you know, the banks might charge a bit more or a bit less. But the banking system is set up, internationally speaking, for large value transfers. They're not set up for retail and remittances, and that's where the the real effort has to take place. And I think it's it's fantastic that the IMF, World Bank, G20 are, are very focused on that. Whether that's what technology their solution is based on is, we'll we'll see. I'm not convinced it will be blockchain, but I don't know. So thanks, Natasha. I have a couple of other questions, but I think uh, given the fact that we have all uh, you know, less than 20, uh, 24 minutes left. Could we request our participant that I will request Arthur to touch upon the latest report, which will actually have some of the answers on international cooperation and standards. And then if we have some time left, we'll be more than happy to address the remaining questions. Thank you. Arthur. Is this visible, Rajesh? Rajesh, are, are we able to see the slides? Yeah, I can see. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the the FinCyber project through the Carnegie Endowment and in collaboration with the World Economic Forum last month published uh, a, a strategy report, the International Strategy to Better Protect the Financial System Against Cyber Threats, um, which was truly a collaborative effort. Uh, and meant to be more of a, a vehicle to affect international policy rather than just a standalone report that might gather dust on a, on a desk or a bookshelf somewhere. Um, so I'm delighted to walk you through very quickly uh, what the goals are with the report and how it relates to fintechs and uh, international cooperation now. 
Um, and to start, I think it's helpful to just provide some context about the collaborative uh, development process for the strategy. Um, so this work began, uh, you know, all the way back um, in 2015 before the Bangladesh incident. Um, but it really kicked off in July 2019 of last year where we gathered a group of scholars at Wilton Park um, in England to discuss uh, what the gaps were and what was missing from the international approach to protect the financial system. And when I say the financial system, we don't think of it as a monolith. There are the, the traditional financial institutions, but there's a tremendous amount of digital transformation. And so um, this group of experts agreed that there was a lack of strategic approach and that many of the um, you know, reactions to the Bangladesh incident and the awareness that cybersecurity could threaten financial stability um, were individualized and reactive. And there was a need for a long-term vision. So we set out to create that vision in collaboration with over 200 stakeholders, um, you know, across the last year that we've consulted with. Um, so we spent the bulk of the time presenting, you know, with FSISAC, with the World Economic Forum, with the International Monetary Fund, um, and held a number of brainstorming sessions and consultations. Uh, so there's been a lot of collaborative feedback that has gone into this process. And what we came up with um, was truly an, a recognition that there were gaps between uh, the different key communities that touch on this issue. Um, and we had four strategic priorities in mind. The first was that greater clarity about roles and responsibilities was required. We saw a clear responsibility gap around who at, at the international level, at a global governance level, around who is really responsible for protecting the financial system, given that it's an interdependent international system um, that, that everybody needs uh, for a functioning global economy. The second principle was that international collaboration was necessary and urgent. Um, in the wake of the Bangladesh incident, it became clear that there were potentially systemic implications of a major cybersecurity incident. Um, and we can talk about how fintechs are beginning to pose also um, a risk to financial stability. Um, and also a recognition that no one individual could do this alone. Um, the third principle that we had was that fragmentation among the different initiatives uh, was creating uh, transaction costs and duplication of effort. And so just organizing some of these uh, efforts from SWIFT's um, you know, customer security program to the IMF's capacity building programs to the work that the World Bank is doing, better organizing these efforts uh, would free up some capacity to tackle the problem because there is a workforce shortage because there's limited resources to address these issues. And then finally, um, the, the, the other uh, principle is that protecting the financial system can be a model for other sectors. Uh, and so we firmly believed um, our theory of change was working through the financial system, which is generally, generally has access to more resources and a more mature approach to cybersecurity than other sectors would create some positive spillover effects that could be then applied to other sectors um, and could make advancements not only at the national level, but on international collaboration. We thought that it would be easier to get countries to agree on how to protect the financial system um, from cyber threats, and then those lessons could be then applied to other sectors. And so our strategy um, really came down to six key priorities. The first was on cyber resilience. Um, and here, we wanted to ensure that the financial system was set up at an international level uh, to be able to respond and recover quickly from a cyber incident um, with the recognition in mind that a major cyber event is inevitable. The second is on international norms, which really uh, is about how states behave in cyberspace and getting states to agree that um, the manipulation of financial data that could affect the underlying confidence and the integrity of the financial system um, was an off-limits uh, action and should never be used. Um, we we'd never limited state behavior uh, beyond that manipulation, or we, sorry, we never called, not that we have control over state behavior, but we never called for states to limit that um, because 
there's a recognition that we can only do so much and that states will only agree to so much, but we really do strongly believe that there needs to be an international norm against states manipulating the integrity of financial data. The third piece is on collective response, and this really gets at how industry and um, states can cooperate together um, to deter attackers more effectively to catch the bad guys. The fourth is on workforce, uh, and our focus here was not necessarily on um, being prescriptive and explaining which uh, workforce development models were the best, um, because the, the fundamental challenge is we don't quite know. Um, and so our recommendations centered around how to measure and evaluate uh, cybersecurity workforce development programs more effectively to prepare um, governments and nations uh, cybersecurity talent um, for the next generation of threats. The fifth was on capacity building, and this gets back to what Taylor was explaining, but really it's around how to organize these capacity building efforts in recognition that the funding and resources available to um, those who are seeking capacity building programs and efforts are going to be limited, especially in a post-pandemic recovery. And so organizing those efforts across international financial institutions and uh, various industry organizations is essential to making sure that we are best using those resources. And finally, the six was on digital transformation. And this was a core pillar for us and gets to the FinTech piece that we're discussing here today. There's a recognition that um, the financial system is rapidly going under uh, a digital transformation, and this has implications for financial inclusion efforts. Um, and so our core recommendations, which I'll move to in a moment, uh, are, are around, um, one, how do we coordinate better across G20 member states and others? Uh, two, around creating a network of experts that can focus specifically on cybersecurity and financial inclusion in Africa. And then three, ensuring that cybersecurity must be designed into technologies in advance um, rather than uh, as an afterthought. And so the cybersecurity by design principle is essential. Financial institutions, including fintechs, can't see security as an overhead cost, but rather it must be an essential principle that, that's built into products up front. And then finally, um, the, the last recommendation we have is exploring how financial inclusion efforts and financial literacy programs can also increase general awareness around basic cybersecurity principles as we have billions of new users adopting the internet for the first time. And I'll finally uh, wrap up with our next steps um, for the coming year, uh, which are primarily uh, focused on, on four tracks. So as you can see on this slide, we're about two thirds through this timeline where we've gone through um, many consultative processes to develop the strategy. It's now out and published. And our focus is now on developing confidential memos and engaging with key stakeholders behind the scenes to really move the needle with the G7, the G20, um, through the Munich Security Conference, through the World Economic Forum at Davos. Um, and here I would uh, highlight that India is going to be taking on the presidency of the G20 in 2022. And so there's interesting implications for how India can leverage its leadership in digital financial services in payments to move the needle on security as well. Um, and again, day three of the, the tech summit uh, will have opportunities to discuss that. Um, so moving forward in the next six months, we're really trying to identify which of these recommendations in the strategy are the most politically achievable. And we hope this document is an evergreen resource um, to bring together and uh, create connective tissue between the different si siloed communities, not just in um, the financial services industry and the supervisory space, but also in the development communities that touches on financial inclusion, also in the diplomatic community and the national security community as we think about countering nation state malicious activity and cyber threats. Um, so the strategy is really a long-term vision um, so that we can move from a reactive posture to a strategic posture uh, as we think about uh, protecting the financial system from cyber threats long term. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. I would urge you know, the participants to go through the website, uh, the Carnegie Endowment website, where there is a separate section on our cybersecurity work where you will find a lot of resources, including 
the report just released and more many more to come in the next couple of years with the team actively working on these issues. We also have an advisory council and we'll work with regulators around the world uh, to handle to address capacity issues and the toolkit will also go a long way. Thanks for that. So I'm looking at some questions. One is there is a good interesting comment by Kapil. It says we may need a micro swift a nice way of putting it Kapil. Thank you. Uh, then relating to capacity, there is a question from Sachin uh, to myself and Natasha. How do we prepare workforce in India for the digital world when nature of transactions has changed drastically? And the second part is thoughts on Bitcoins and blockchain, which I think I'll reserve because I didn't want to go into that in this session. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a long discussion in itself and we hope we'll get a chance to do it at some point of time. So you're right as, as just now, you know, my colleagues did mention that capacity is a serious challenge with the regulators, with the governments, as well as people capacity. I mean, I was just reading a report a few days back where, you know, there is a shortage of cybersecurity experts. Uh, I don't remember the number, but I am given to understand every country is facing a serious shortage of trained workforce in the area of cybersecurity. So even if a fintech does want to hire and is taking, you know, it seriously, they might face a challenge. So I would say that the only thing will be our universities and a lot of institutions do offer, you know, courses. There are options like open MOOCs that are offered on cybersecurity. So some of these options should be used by young people like you, Sachin, to train yourself and to gear up for you know being a cybersecurity expert. What with the fact that there is a shortage of cybersecurity expert. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. I'm flattered that you posed that um, I was included in, <laughs> in the people that should respond to that question. Um, but let me tell you that um, I think Britain's got a much big, bigger problem than, than you have uh, probably in India when it comes to technical expertise. And when we look at our education system, we are skewed away from technology uh, and and uh, the STEM uh, the STEM subjects. Uh, whereas you're skewed too, I believe in India, or at least I know that we get an awful lot of our our workforce, as does the US, uh, out of the Indian schools. So keep them at home, <laughs> stay at home. Um, I think it's probably the most important thing. But I believe that that's been happening. Uh, anyway, but I, I think you're in probably in a much much better position than some of the other countries, I and mean, particularly particularly the UK. I think the one of the really important things with cyber, whether it whether it relates to Carnegie's wider effort or to education or to career choices, is the publicity around cybersecurity. And the Bangladesh attack was positive in that it showed that everybody is vulnerable, that this is a global problem and that it's not about having a fortress in New York. A fortress in New York is vulnerable to a problem in Bangladesh and vice versa. And I think the more that cybersecurity or cyber issues are written about and the more that we that we don't allow a crisis to go past and don't take opportunity about um, from it, you know, every every great cri every crisis is an opportunity. Um, and it's, it's also an opportunity in publicity terms, because if people become as students, young people become aware of the opportunity that, that the threat and the opportunity they they will migrate towards it, I think. And it also will help efforts like the Carnegie's effort to focus uh, legislators and, and regulators attention, public policy attention on this issue. It's not one that can be ignored. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, honestly, we, as you rightly mentioned, Natasha, one of the things is I see a major opportunity for startups focusing on cybersecurity itself. And it's it's a, a very important, you know, area. I'm not sure, uh, you know, have we seen a lot of startups in cybersecurity come up in US or UK? I'm not aware. In India, I haven't seen too many of them being spoken about.
In the U.S. context, um, Natasha, I'll let you speak to the U.K. context, but in the U.S. context, yes, there are a significant number of startups occurring. There's a trend where um, experts will create a startup, apply some new innovation or technology, and then it will get acquired by a larger managed service provider. Um, if anybody has tracked the uh, breaking story around uh, the breach of the U.S. government essentially through the managed service provider solar winds. Um, it's a good example of how large managed, managed security providers um, can create some concentration risk. Um, but the startups are often acquired. Um, the other trend I would say is uh, many of these startups are focusing on some of the more cutting edge technologies where they'll specialize. Um, so there's a big trend around applying machine learning to cybersecurity practices. Um, and uh, many financial institutions are acquiring just even the, the smaller cyber security startups to bring them into their security operations. Um, in the UK, some, I mean, I think the biggest, um, the biggest focus has probably been certainly in recent, in the last couple of years has been around payments and probably over optimistic uh, amounts of startups in, in the payments area with with business plans that will be being put to the test by the combination of low rates and, and COVID, I think, despite the migration to digital. Where we have, I think, um, and, and this is another area for um, the work, you know, workforce or pipeline development. I live in, in Wales, which is very close to Cheltenham, which is the, um, which is where GCHQ, our sort of national uh, signals agency is. And around that in that sort of diaspora there's a lot of staff that have left and, and created startups but these are sort of mid-career rather than younger people um which is you know it, everything's good um but i think it would it would be good to see younger startups and not just the national security um contingent leaving uh the much needed uh, roles to to go into the private sector but both in the us and the uk the the uh, the industry has, and, and Israel, and, and I'm sure in, in most other countries, the industry has been bought at, born out of the public sector. So if the public sector doesn't invest, then the private sector will not flourish. So public sector investment is absolutely key. Yeah. Thanks, Antarya. So I don't see any other questions. Anybody else want to ask anything? We have just a few minutes left. Uh, if not, then, you know, uh, as you've seen in the chat, Arthur has posted the link to our Fin Cyber project page. Uh, those of you who are interested in following up our work, please do look at it. Uh, any closing comments? Uh, maybe I'll invite Taylor, then Arthur and Natasha, as we have about four or five minutes left. Taylor, any? Closing comments on where do we see the future of fintech and cybersecurity going? You are on mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go on. <laughs> um, no, I think this has been a great discussion, and, and thank you all for tuning in um, this afternoon and morning. Um, I think I think this is this has raised a lot of interesting things for me to think about uh, for my own work on the capacity building toolbox as we think of where to expand. Um, you know, on the question that, that we've, we've talked already about, about harmonization of different protocols, that's something mm -hmm. that I think, um, you know, as Arthur said, I think there's some reason to be optimistic for the financial sector that we could get there sooner than we can get uh, to sort of international harmonization on other mm -hmm. uh, protocols. Uh, but I do think we're we're still going to need um, real pushes in in national and regional areas, and that's where, uh, you know, different different strategies like like the toolbox um, and like other sort of strategic uh, tools that can be employed in those spaces are really helpful for bridging some of those gaps and filling in, and I think pushing towards um, more harmonization in in um, in cybersecurity protocols, uh, you know, we've already seen our toolbox is very careful that we don't uh, we don't say that we're a regulation, but but we do have supervisors who look at it and say, mm -hmm. you know, this is actually a great way to to help uh, provide a baseline. So hopefully, we'll see movement. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Arthur. I would just end on uh, the note that um, India and, and many other emerging economies um, and industrializing economies taking adv full advantage of the fourth industrial revolution are better positioned to lead in this space than many of the, the Western countries that have legacy uh, institutions and entrenched ideas around financial services. As we see the democratization and decentralization of finance, um, India will be well positioned to lead in this space um, one, because they can leapfrog many of the financial services and um, technologies of past decades. And two, because, uh, you know, Western countries, particularly the U.S., have benefited from a very centralized financial system, even from a geopolitical standpoint, as you think about how they use sanctions, etc. And so they'll resist um, some movement towards this decentralized um, you know, space around fintechs. Um, and so I think it'll be incumbent upon uh, India and others to lead in this space because, um, you know, even just the, the growth we've seen and the advances we've seen through financial inclusion efforts have truly changed the quality of life for billions of people around the world. And so ensuring consumer protection for those services while ensuring that the, the rollout of those services reaches uh, many of the new users accessing the internet will be essential, and we can't, uh, the U.S. may be an anchor in this discussion rather than a champion. Um, and how India and, and others take this forward and look forward to the conversations tomorrow. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, Nataja, 30 seconds, sorry, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Very quickly, I love the, um, the, two, the two words, India leads, and I think um, up until now, the U.S. has been in a somewhat of a protagonist position, which is problematic because not everyone agrees with the U.S. or wants to be a net taker of the U.S. There need to be more people at more people at the table, and India has a voice to use it, grow it, and use it. So, thank you, everyone, uh, for this, my colleagues, and for all the participants coming up with questions, which which have nudged our thinking to a next level. And uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, this knowledge transfer session. And on this note that fintech uh, will definitely lead to inclusion of billions of people in a cyber secure manner, I would like to end this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.